If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 13. I hope to work through the latter part of John chapter 13, the first part of John chapter 14 this morning. Pray for me as I stand before you that the Lord would bless, the Holy Spirit would be part of our gathering here today. Uh, Jesus has just finished the Passover uh, supper with his disciples. And if you read through to verse 17, he's now washed the feet of his disciples. And he gives us in verse 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. This is really a pinnacle moment in the life of Jesus and his disciples as, as their Lord, their King, their Master, the one that they've been following for three and a half years in servant leadership, um, bows before these disciples and washes their feet. It's something that I can't even imagine when you picture it, the feeling that they must have had. Um, and, and, and he knows this is something he says in verse 14, that we ought to wash one another's feet in both a symbolic way and I also believe it's an example that Christ gave to his church, that his church should gather together from time to time to wash the feet of their brothers and sisters in a literal way. And if you've ever been a part of a service uh, like that, you know it could be a little strange as, as the world hears it, but if you ever gather into it and actually do it, it's a feeling that I believe the Holy Spirit brings upon you, a feeling of, 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 of I wouldn't say a feeling of humbleness, but a feeling of unworthiness is what I feel, that I could stand before or kneel before my brothers and wash their feet. But this is really a pinnacle moment in the life of, of these disciples. But starting in verse 18, he's going to start bringing some troubling news to his disciples. And, we'll, and I want to look this morning at least five things that in, the, in the latter part of John 13 that are going to trouble the hearts of these disciples who have been walking with Jesus and talking with Jesus for three and a half years. And the first is found in, a, in the biggest part of this that we'll read today. The biggest chunk is verse 18 through 30. And in verse 18 it says, If I speak, I speak not of you all, this is Jesus speaking, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come to pass, or before it come, that when it come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked on one another, or on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask of who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Simon entered into him, or under the, after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that were in need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, immediately uh, went out, and it was night. As the disciples often do, there's confusion, and we'll see that confusion is one of the things that troubles your hearts. Uh, but what Jesus is experiencing right here is betrayal. As we talk about the five things or, or, or more that we'll look at today that can trouble your heart, uh, one of them is a betrayal of a friend. I'm sure some of you today have had friend groups. I think about um, high schoolers or middle schoolers and, and you know um, girls can be mean. <laughs> middle school girls can be mean. High school girls can be mean. Boys can be mean, right? Uh, bullying is a big problem that we have in schools today. People can just be mean. That's one thing that the Christian should not be found doing is bullying or picking on someone else. But I know I've had friends in the past as a child and even you'll have them um, throughout life who will you will think you're so close and you will think that, that there's nothing that could separate the two of you. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a church member. Um, but, but people will betray you, right? And that's something that can burden your heart or trouble 
your heart. Brother Mark mentioned in the prayer request or the praise report or whatever you want to call it, the people that are not here, that could be here, that should be here, that troubles you. Uh, as, as a minister, as church members, as people who are excited about the church, when people um, that have made a, a covenant with God, and people that have, that have made a covenant with this church, people that have been baptized in water and, and joined this fellowship but tend to, to slack off and not come, that hurts people, doesn't it? It hurts you. It, 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 you want to see them. Uh, it's, it's not something you want to be mean to them or criticize them. You just want to see them, right? And it hurts. It's, a, it's really a betrayal of, of the decision they made to follow Jesus. But we shouldn't be surprised when that happens in our life because it's a pattern of human behavior that people are going to let you down, right? Uh, unfortunately, that is a pattern of behavior. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 14, we, uh, Paul is ending his letter and he says, he says this, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. We are introduced to this man named Demas. Now we don't know a whole lot about him but we know in the letter to Philemon in the 24th verse that Paul lists him as one of the fellow laborers that labored with Paul in the gospel. So we know a little bit about Demas that he was he greeted the church at Colossians and that he was a laborer with Christ or with with Paul in the gospel of Christ. But if we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4 I want to look at some verses of scripture that we'll find and make a few comments that will give us a little more insight into Demas and into the things that Paul suffered. We'll notice these things that we look at that trouble your heart. Either Jesus was, was experiencing this or the disciples had experienced this, and it's common uh, to all mankind to experience this. And in verse 9 of chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, this is the last epistle that Paul's going to write uh, to his, his son in the ministry, Timothy. He says in verse 9, Now, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can hear in this that Paul is writing that he's lonely and he needs someone to come see him. Uh, Paul, I believe in this same chapter, uh, it's, or in this same book in chapter 1 in verse 16, he says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Anesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. See, Paul's in prison. He's, he's under uh, imprisonment. He says, But when he was in Rome, this is Anesiphorus, he sought me out very diligently and found me you know what that says Anesiphorus when he says he sought him out very diligently he was he was he was not careless in doing this he was doing it on purpose right and now Paul's writing to Timothy and he says do thy diligence Timothy to come shortly unto me and we see in this something that I've been thinking of often and it's a it's a ministry that you and I um, no, no matter our uh, what our bank account looks like or, or a lot of our abilities we have uh, this ministry that we can offer to people, it's the ministry of presence, right? The ministry of just being there. Um, the, the ministry of, uh, of being with your brothers and sisters when they're in. Sometimes there's nothing like just being there, right? Uh, last night when I went to see the, the Decens, I really didn't know what to say, but I just wanted to be there. Um, as you could tell, they were upset. This was a tragic thing that had happened. And they didn't know, if, uh, you know, what was going on with Allison's hand. But uh, now I'll be honest with you, there was a part of me that wanted to go to bed. <laughs> and I'm not bragging on myself. I don't get this wrong. But then I thought, I can't go tomorrow and preach on the, the, the ministry of presence and have gone to bed when I could have been there. There's a saying I like to repeat to myself over and over. And it says this, you can pretend to care. A lot of people pretend to care, right? You can pretend to care but you cannot pretend to be there. So you can say, oh, brother, I love you. But if you don't show up, do you really love them? Right? Are you really showing that you love them? You can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to be there. I can't tell you how it warms the preacher's heart or the, the pastor's heart or, or to see people come into the fellowship and worship God and how much it hurts. Uh, there, there are people that I've reached out to and, and that others have reached out to and, and said, we love you and want to see you back. And you know what the response usually is? I'm planning on being there next week. That's usually the response. And then the next week comes and they don't come and it hurts, does it not? When you're supposed to, to who likes to get stood up for a, maybe you got a date. <laughs> Would y'all like that? You want your date to be there, right? Well, we can, we can, we, we shouldn't just pretend to care in the church. We should be there for one another. I, if you're a member of Vestavia Primitive Baptist Church or a friend of our church, I want you to know, as Brother Mark mentioned in the prayer request, what an awesome thing you have been blessed with. A family that loves you. 
Maybe you don't have a good natural family, but if you're here in Vestavia, I'm telling you, you got a good church family. And we love you. And let's, let's, let's try even harder. I think we do a great job of showing that we love one another. I've seen people going to the hospital and the church spring into action, and it just warms my heart to see it, right? And I'm telling you, it's a blessing to do it for others. You're not going to be blessed unless you do uh, come in and show your ministry of presence and being there with them. And so Paul says to Timothy, do thy diligence to come unto me shortly. And then we get back to Demas. In verse 10, he says, for or because Demas, this fellow laborer, this one that greeted the church at Colossae, he says, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. That's some of the saddest words in the Bible that you can read, right? This fellow laborer with Paul the Apostle has now abandoned him for, the, for this world. And this world has nothing to offer you, child of God, uh, that's any better than what's in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see that Paul was abandoned. In John chapter 12, if you flip over from our study chapter, um, it's, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. Uh, it says in verse 12, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. These people are, are laying their palm trees out. They're welcoming this king into Jerusalem. And just days later, some of them would be saying, Give us Barabbas. <laughs> we want Barabbas. Jesus knew. He was acquainted with what it is to be betrayed by your friends. So that's the first thing we look at that will learn from, from, that will trouble your heart in John chapter 13. In verse 31, Jesus has just talked about, uh, just, just had this discourse with Judas. And in verse 31, he says, Therefore, when he was gone out, that is Judas, Jesus said, so now he's with his 11 disciples. And Jesus says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and straightway glorify him. I believe we can break that down into what Jesus is saying is now I'm, I'm going to do what I came into the world to do, and that is to save my people from their sins. That's what, that's what, that, that was the glory of God on that cross. And to the outside world, uh, it may look like this was a weak man who was being killed by Romans. But if you look a little further from heaven's perspective, this was the Lamb of God who was taking away the sin of the world. He was taking away the sin of God's elect. He was taking away the sin that you and I should have suffered in hell forever for. And he's saying, I'm going to be glorified. You know, God's ways are not our ways, right? Uh, we, we, wouldn't have, we probably wouldn't have sent um, the Savior into the womb of a, of a poor virgin and to be born in a, in a stable and to, be, and to be mocked and rejected of men. We would have probably come in and... and you know, we'd have, wanted to, we'd have had the Donald Trump life, right? We'd have been big and, and, and bragging and saying, look what I've done. That's not what Jesus did. But now Jesus is going to be glorified like no one had been glorified before because he was going to do what no one could do. He was going to save his people from their sins. And in verse 33, he says, Little children, yet a little while am I with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I see, or I say to you, this is the second thing that troubles their hearts, is, is they're losing their leader and they're losing their hope, right? Have you ever put your trust in someone who maybe betrayed you, uh, like, like, not like Judas did, but maybe someone who's going, maybe it's a father, right? A great father. And, and when your father passes away, that's a, that's, that's uh, praise God, I haven't had to face that, but I know when my grandfather died, I looked so up to him and it's a loss, you know, they're gone, and it hurts, right? And that's what these disciples are facing uh, right here, that they're, that they're their leader. Uh, the one who, you know, in John chapter 6, when the multitude are there, what do they say? They say, we want to make this man a king. Y'all remember that? We want, to, we want to make him a king over Israel. And, and the disciples had seen that, and the disciples had put their trust in this man. And now he's saying, I'm going away. Uh, we were going to... Uh, Evie Grace is going to kindergarten next year. We were driving to see her school and had a little orientation thing for the children. And, and, and I thought this was a good question from a five-year-old. She said, uh, does, does Jesus ever call adults children? <laughs> and I referenced this verse. 
you know, in verse 33, he says, little children, yet a little while am I with you. I said, yes, I guess he does, baby. And he said, did he have bad eyesight? <laughs> I said, no, he sees all. But it's a term of endearment that he's using to his disciples. You can, you can almost feel in this verse that, that you don't want to see children in pain. You don't want to see children hurting. You don't want to see children confused, children picked on. You can almost see that, that he's, he's, he's the love he had for his disciples in this term of endearment. He says, little, little children, yet a little while am I with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you. Uh, John Gill commenting on that part says, you shall seek me. He says, as a person in distress under great concern, not knowing what to do or where to go. The disciples were going to be lost. This leader, this man that they had given up their lifestyle for, they'd given up their careers for, and they were following is now leaving. They're going to be lost. Uh, an example I thought when looking through this is, <laughs> this is this is a little silly, but one day Nick Saban's going to leave Alabama, right? And we got a lot of Alabama fans here, and we're going to be lost, right? <laughs> Hopefully that's 10, 20, 30 years down the road. <laughs> but if time's any indicator, it's not. Now the Auburn fans are looking forward to that, right? The rest of the world's looking forward to that, I guess. <laughs> but they're going to be lost. Well, it's, it's, it's it, on, a, on a much bigger scale now. These disciples, if they put their hope in Jesus, they were going to be lost. So they're facing the loss of their leader. And then in verse 34 and 35, he says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So the third thing that they're facing here is now change. And I know that's not a four-letter word, but most people don't like change, right? Now, every eight years, somebody gets elected because of change to the presidency, right? We love it then, but we want some change, and then we complain about it a year later. But how many people like it work when your boss comes to you and says, we're changing the way we do this, or we're changing the way we do that? Most of the time, when they leave the room, we grumble, well, what was wrong with the way it was before, right? Don't we? We do. We don't like change. We all deal with change, and most of us don't like it. I, I live on 280. Does he, I don't know if many of you live on 280, but about two years ago, they changed the whole road up where you had to do these. You couldn't just go straight, and you couldn't turn just left. You had to make a U-turn, then you had to go back and turn right. And I kind of liked it. You know, once, and then, I, then I found out it was called a Michigan left, and I thought, well, we don't need this Yankee stuff in Alabama. So I kind of didn't like it after that. Um, but, you know, I heard a lot of people complaining about how, now traffic was probably flowing better, <laughs> but a lot of people didn't like it because it was just change, right? Well, here the disciples are facing change. He's giving them a new commandment. In what way is this new? Uh, in, in what ways is this a new commandment? In, in Leviticus chapter 19, let's, let's look at Leviticus 19, and, and we'll pull one verse out of there. Uh, they're, they're giving these diverse laws and ordinances to the children of Israel. And in verse 18, we have this that the children of Israel would have been familiar with. It says, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So this, this thought of loving your neighbor as you love yourself, and we all love ourselves, right? We don't, have to, uh, we don't have to kid anybody. We love ourselves. Now, we show ourselves a lot of grace. We show ourselves a lot of mercy. Uh, but here in these laws that, that God's giving to Israel, he says you're to love your neighbor as yourself. But now as he's looking at his disciples in John chapter 13, he says this new commandment I'm giving to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus has now stepped up uh, from loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Now you're to love each other as Jesus loved you. Right? In the first part of this chapter, uh, I believe it's the first verse, he says after the supper was over, he, he loved them unto the end. Jesus' love is a never-ending love, right? It's a love that doesn't go, in Jeremiah chapter, I guess it's 33, it says, Lo, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. It's a love that doesn't give up, right? So how are you to love your spouse? You're to love your spouse with a never-ending love. 
right? It's, it's, you're never to give up on them. How are you to love your church members? What about those church members we talked about who are sporadic or don't come? What are we to do? Are we to, are we to make a big show out of them and, and talk about how bad they are? No, right? We're supposed to love them and continue to love them and continue to encourage them and to continue to pray for them. He says that is the commandment that I'm giving uh, to you. It's a self-sacrificial love. When you don't want to go see somebody we talked about the ministry of presence when you don't want to do this for the church you don't want to do this for your family jesus says you're to love one another as i loved you he gave of himself right so you give of your time you give of your money you give of uh, of yourself for others that you could sacrifice yourself to love one another and then jesus had just washed their feet so it's a humble love right you're serving each other because they're better than you right you 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 look at people not that well, I'm better than them, but you look to your brothers and sisters and say, no, they're better than me, right? It's a humble love that you're to love one another. So that's what, the, this, that's what he's saying. It's a new commandment. But also in this commandment, it's now um, a, a new way that these people, these Christians, this, this, this early church here of these 11 disciples, it's how the church and disciples and Christians are going to be identified in God's world. He says, by this, by this love, that you have for one another, all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. He's saying church, he's saying disciples, Christians, the way that the world, the way that all men are going to know there's something different about you and you're following uh, something different than the world is following is the way you love. It's not the way you dress, it's not the way you talk, it's not uh, the, the, the car you drive or the places you work, it's the way you love, right? This, this, this transcends all cultures. It transcends um, American culture. It, you could go anywhere in this world and you can see there's something different about true Christians because it's the way they love, right? That's what he's saying here. There's a new commandment and the church is going to be known by the way it loves one another. May God give us the strength to love as Jesus loved. What This is... This is in, rooted in this is evangelism, right? Because people are going to see that something is different about the way you walk and the way you talk and the things you do and the way you love your brothers and sisters. And people are going to ask, right? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, did he not? And I believe it's Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Peter would say in, in uh, chapter, 1 Peter 3.15, I believe it is, or 16, he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. You're going to live a different way if you've set the Lord apart in your hearts, right? And then right after that, he says, and be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that's within you. Now, why are people asking? Because you're walking different and you're talking different because you've sanctified God in your heart, right? So, Paul, so, so Jesus is saying to these disciples, you're going to live a different way than the world has lived. You're going to love people as I loved you. And by this, people are going to know that you're my disciples. Verse 36, it says, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me, but thou shalt follow, or canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me hereafter. Uh, another thing that we see here is Simon is now confused this man that he's followed and left everything is leaving he says he says where are you going now jesus has been uh, talking with his disciples for three years telling them of what he came to do and he was going to the cross to pay for the sins and now the time has come and peter's saying i don't understand where are you going he's confused do any of you get confused in this life i get confused about where i put my keys every day <laughs> right i get confused about a lot of things i'm confused I was talking with a coworker this week as we were traveling. My coworker is probably um, almost 30 years older than I am, right? So, and 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 I'm I'm, uh, and y'all know I'm a proponent of this. If you get time with people who have been there and done that, pick their brain as much as you can, right? Now, we don't need to go to the self-help books of the world or the seminars of the Christian community when we have brothers and sisters in the church who have been there. And follow their path, right? Who have been there and done that. Learn from their mistakes so you don't make their mistakes. And we were talking about uh, jobs and, and, and careers and those type of things. And my coworker said to me, uh, now, it's been doing what I do for 20 more years than I've done it. Uh, it says, well, I'm just waiting for God to show me what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and I feel like I'm in that, that, that path or that, that category a lot of the times. I'm waiting. I'm confused. What is it, God, that you want 
me to do in this life. Do any of y'all feel that from time to time? <laughs> I mean, here's somebody that's, that's, that's 30 years older than I am and still waiting. That comforted me, and it also made me feel bad, and also made me think, I wonder if 30 years from now I'm still going to be wondering. <laughs> y'all ever get that feeling I'm not doing it right? <laughs> I get that feeling a lot. Somebody recently said, you know, I'm just trying harder. I'm trying to read my Bible more. I'm trying to study more. I'm trying to go to church more. You know, I want, I want to, to do what's right, and that's a good thing. And my message to them was, well, I, I understand that, but I want you to understand that God is rich in mercy, and none of us are doing it right. None of us are knocking the ball out of the park, right? None of us are hitting for a 1,000. Um, all of us struggle and fall all of us are confused in this life and so here simon peter is confused where are you going jesus answered where i'm going you can't follow me now thou shalt follow me hereafter in verse 37 and 38 peter said unto him lord why cannot i follow thee now uh, here's something we deal with a lot it's a little impatience isn't it jesus peter didn't even know what he's asking for really does he but he's saying, he says, Lord, now that's bold. He, he looks up to Jesus and says, Lord, why can't I follow you right now? <laughs> Jesus has told him, you're going to follow me afterwards. Why can't I follow you right now? So one thing, uh, maybe what on my list of five, there's some impatience that we see in Peter's. And, and listen, folks, in, we live in a world of instant gratification, right? I mean, from video games to, to Facebook and Twitter. I mean, it's, we, we want information, we get information. And we want things now. And sometimes, maybe you're thinking, what is God's will for my life? Uh, the Bible will say over and over, wait on the Lord, right? He may not come on your time, but you don't want to go out before him. And you don't want to stay after he showed you what you should do. Uh, you don't want to hinder the Lord. But here Peter is saying, I, I want to follow you right now. And then he gets real bold and he looks to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and says, I, Peter, I will lay down my life for thy sake. And, and I think Peter was sincere. He was wrong. He wasn't going to do it. But he, he felt like he would. And Jesus looks to him and says, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. And so Peter here, as his heart is being troubled, he's now face to face with his human weakness. Do you all face that a lot? Uh, you, sometimes I like to think that I'm um, better than I am or stronger than I am in, in my nature. But you, we are so reliant on God, are we not? Do we, God would say, Jesus would say, just one chapter over, uh, without me, you can do some things. Is that what he said? He says, without me, you, you can do nothing. There is nothing in, in the walk of discipleship, nothing good in this life that you can do without the help of God, without the help of the Holy Spirit. But Peter's really looking to himself and says, I'm going to do this. But Jesus brings him face to face uh, with his weakness. And, and you know, I, I see this a lot in my life. I say, I'm going to get up an hour early and I'm gonna, you know, than I usually do and pray for 30 minutes and read for 30 minutes or... I'm going to do this, I'm going to, you know, a lot of times I have, it, a lot of times it's real late at night when I'm going to bed, what I'm going to do the next day. Y'all ever have that? Am I the only one that does that? Tomorrow I'm going to get up and I'm going to exercise an hour. And I, and I may, you know, when I get home from work, sometimes I'm going to do the laundry for carrier. I'm going to do this or that. And usually I come face to face with my human weakness. When that alarm clock goes off, that shows you just how weak you are a lot of times, right? Uh, somebody said uh, a human uh, doesn't realize their lack of self-control until you put chips and salsa in front of them, <laughs> right? That's all you need to realize how, how you're really not in control, right? <laughs> Any of y'all love chips? I love chips and salsa too, right? Amen. Well, here Peter is faced with his weakness, and if you feel like that, you're in good company. Look at Romans chapter 7, and I hope this is a verse that you're familiar with. The Apostle Paul is writing the church at Rome, and he says in verse 18 of chapter 7, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, or for the good that I would, that's he's saying the good that I want to do, I do not. But that evil which I would not, that I do. 
Paul was being honest with this church that the things that he wants to do, he finds himself not doing, and the things that he doesn't want to do, the things that he wants to abstain from, that's what he finds himself doing. And my friends, human nature has not changed since the Apostle Paul wrote this. We are all in that same boat. The things that we want to do, especially if we're looking to ourselves, we're never going to do it. And the things that we want to, we want to stay away from, we'll find ourselves drifting uh, towards that from time to time unless we stay with our eyes pointed to Jesus Christ. So, so we've seen here that, that, that change is coming, um, that, that there's confusion, uh, that their, their human frailty has been on display, that their leader is going away and then they're going to be betrayed by Judas. And in chapter 14, Jesus looks back to his disciples and says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Some of the greatest words that were ever recorded in Scripture are found in chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, in my opinion. He looks to these disciples, and, and, and all this news, right after he had washed their feet, this news like a bomb has been dropped on these disciples, and Jesus knows their hearts, right? Jesus knew what was going on. Their, the, the, their equanimity, their, their, um, they, they were down and out. And he's not talking about the, the organ that pumps blood in your chest, right? He's talking about uh, your soul and your spirit and what really drives you in this life. It, the heart's the spiritual part of us where our, where our emotions dwell and our desires dwell, right? Uh, it, it's it's, it's uh, the, the, the writer in Proverbs would say, keep thy heart with all diligence, He's saying you need to do that on purpose, right? Protect your heart because, because out of your heart are the issues of life. What you're going to do in this life are, are driven by your heart, right? And how you prepare your heart. So child of God, we need to be cognizant of the things we listen to and the things we watch and the, the things we let into our life because those affect your heart. And what affects your heart affects your life. And you've only got one life here, right? <laughs> There's only one life you're going to live. In this life, before you go on to glory, and and so so child of God, it is important that we watch uh, what we let affect our heart. But here Jesus looks to him and says, "Let." That's a key word. Let not your heart be troubled. Uh, there are some who believe that that basically uh, God's children are just robots that are going to persevere and they're going to live a righteous life. But here, here Jesus, God is saying, "You have the power of decision." whether you're going to let your heart be troubled or not, right? We were made in the image of God, and one of the things that God says in the book of Genesis is let us do this and let us do that. The creation was, was, was a uh, decision that God made, right? And we, as image bearers of God, have the power to decide what we're going to do, uh, even, even more than what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear or where we're going to live. We have the power to control our inward beings, now, outside of God, your heart is going to be troubled. But here he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So I'm going to go through four things as we close this morning. Uh, four ways, that, that uh, the four steps or the four aspects, whatever you want to call it, that Jesus gives his disciples so that they won't live in this troubled life where their heart, uh, where the, where the, 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 that controls their issues of this life, that controls the way they live, would not be troubled. And the first thing he says is you need to look to me, if you're not going to have your life troubled, if you're not going to live this troubled life, then you need to look to me. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Now, he's talking to, to, to Jewish men who knew the laws of God, who were raised in this. And, and he says, you believed in me. And that word believe, uh, one of the definitions, really, if you look at it, is to hold dear. They held the God of creation. They held the God of Israel dear. But he's saying, if you're not going to let your heart be troubled, you need to also believe in me. You need to hold me as dear as you held this, 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 Jew, this Jewish religion you came from. You need to hold me dear. You need to think of me often. Uh, you, you know, it's easy to believe that there is a God, right? But it is, it is the, the great separator of the Christian religion is the belief in Jesus Christ. He says, you need to hold me dear. I know it's, it, it's for the child of God who, 
who, who has been touched by the Spirit of God and who's troubled over their sins, is there nothing better than that gospel that Jesus is the mediator between God and man? There's nothing better, right? And until you believe that, you're not going to have peace with God. And I'm not talking about peace for all eternity, but I'm talking about peace with God right here and right now. You're not going to have that kind of peace until you hold God dear. So the first thing he says is, if you're not going to let your heart be troubled, then I want you to look to me. Look to me for your life. And then he says, I want you to remember that there's more to life than just this world. <laughs> he takes their mind from this temporal world and these, these, these changing circumstances and he points them to eternity, right? He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I love that. I go to prepare a place for you. He, 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 he turns to them and says, in my Father's house, that's a, that's a picture of heaven. And don't you love that in my Father's house? Sometimes it's good. Uh, I've been out of the house for years now. But uh, last night we went to my parents' house. And sometimes it's just good to go to my Father's house, right? <laughs> I'm an only child, so I tell them, you know, everything in here is mine eventually anyways. <laughs> of course, we're joking. But, but when you're a child, the other day Bo was running around a house and, um, and, and he was just having fun, and we were timing him. And maybe it was a plot by me to make him sleep a little better that night. You know, let me see if you can make it any better. And they'd gone four or five laps, and the neighbor's dog had come out and started barking. And Bo turned, and, and I could hear him coming back around the house. Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. He wanted to come to his daddy, right? Sometimes it's good just to go to your father's house, right? Just to go to your father and cry to him. And he's telling these these, these troubled disciples. He says, there's something better than what you're going to experience in this life, and it's in my Father's house in heaven. And listen to what he says, are many mansions. I love that. Not that there will be many mansions, or not that there could be many mansions. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. It's a great number. It's a large number. It's a multitude. In Revelation 7, 9, uh, John would get a glimpse of heaven. He says, behold, I saw a great multitude in heaven, right? Uh, this idea that heaven, there'll just be a few people there, is false. And it's not, uh, it doesn't correlate with the Word of God. Over and over, when, when, the, when the Word of God talks about heaven, it talks about the many. It talks about those that are out of every nation, every kindred, every tribe, and every tongue. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. And there will be no vacancies in heaven when this world ends, right? I believe every one of those mansions, of those dwelling places, will be secured or will be they, they will be entered into by God's children. Th then he says, um, if it were not so, I would have told you. Don't you like that? Uh, in, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Paul writing to Titus says, the God that cannot lie. <laughs> Don't you love that? The God that can't lie. It's not in his nature to lie. He cannot do it. So Jesus is telling them, in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it weren't so, I would have told you. And then the third thing that you've got to remember if you're not going to let your heart be troubled is you need to remember what Christ did for you right by himself. <laughs> right? He says, I go. Notice that. I go to prepare a place for you. I go. He didn't say, I'm going to get you all together and I'm going to go do my part and then you take it to the world so maybe they can be saved. Right? He didn't say, I'm going to go and preachers for the next few generations are going to go to try to prepare a place for you. He says, I'm going by myself. And all the disciples in their human weakness were going to flee from him. Some of them even cussing, saying, I don't know the man. He knew that there was nobody there that could help, that could go to do. And he's not saying, I'm going back to heaven to build these mansions. If you've already noticed, the mansions are already there. This week I spent two nights in a hotel away from home. And before I went to those hotels, you know what I did? I made the proper preparations to have a place to lay my head and have a place that I could spend the night. Christ is saying, I'm going to make the proper preparations so that one day you can live in these mansions. And the preparations were not to put it on a visa card that can be paid off a month later. It was that he was going to go and be nailed to a cross and suffer the wrath of God and bleed and die for you so that you could be there one day with him. 
That's the preparations that God is saying. Jesus is saying, I'm going to do what no one else could do. Only me, myself, and I could do this. And I'm going to do it. Aren't you glad that, that Jesus came with a mission and fulfilled his mission and now we can rest in the finished work of a successful Savior? I love that. I go to prepare a place for you. Child of God, when this world is troubling you, there's nothing better that you can look to, that you can, you can point your life to and your mind to than the finished work of God. Because the worst thing that could probably happen to you in this life is they take your life, but God has already secured you a home in His Father's house. Isn't that good news? Amen? <laughs> and then the last thing, if you're not going to let your heart be troubled, the fourth thing that Christ lays out to His apostles is to remember that I'm coming back. In, in, in chapter 3, He says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, if I go and do what I came to do, if I go and make the preparations for your eternal home, I will come again. We believe He went, right? We believe He bled. We believe He died. We believe He rose again. We believe He ascended into heaven and that He accomplished the task that He came to accomplish. And child of God, the words to you today are, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What if we lived every day in the reality that Jesus is coming back, right? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians as I close. And, and we tried to preach through the first chapter of, of 1 Thessalonians the last month or so. And I just want to read a few verses to you. This is a troubled church in a troubled world. In, 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 in a countercultural world, these are people who are trying to serve God, uh, but the culture around them hates it. Much like we, we, we can experience now, we see that it's coming with America. And Paul, over and over in his letter to them, talks about the coming of Jesus. In, in, in chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, And to wait for his Son from heaven. And in chapter 2, he ends that chapter in verse 19. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Then in chapter 3 and verse 13, he says, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. In chapter 4 and verse 15 of 1 Thessalonians, he says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And then he ends the, the, ends the book in chapter 5 and verse 23. He says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, for your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless when? Until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's coming a day that will be like any other day that we've ever experienced where the clouds will bust open, the trump of God will sound, and Jesus Christ himself will descend. Those that have died and are no longer with us will raise up uh, from their graves and we will all be gathered together to spend eternity in our Father's house. That's good news, isn't it? Until that day, there's no better place to spend than in the, the house of God, Right? We're going to spend eternity in the Father's house. But until then, in this temporal world, God has set up His own house, His own family. It's called the Church of God. And if you want to join His church today, we'll give you that opportunity now. As we sing a hymn, you can come forward. That's the way we do it here. And um, we would love nothing better than for you to join with us today. Do we have a number we'd like to sing today, brothers and sisters? Number 